I'm going to introduce um, Jeanette Williams, who is the marketing and outsource specialist at Harvest Medicine, and she's going to do the formal introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, yes, my name is Jeanette Williams. I've been with Harvest Medicine for several years now, and it is my pleasure today to introduce our two keynote speakers. So first up, we'll have Dr. Olga De Sanctis. She joined Harvest Medicine in 2017 and has been with us ever since, helping patients improve their quality of life and seeing positive benefits with uh, medical cannabis. Uh, and she was uh, promoted to our medical director in 2020. So we we're very excited to have Dr. DeSanctis speak about um, medical cannabis and neuropathic pain. And following that, we will have Faraz Sachadina, who has also been with Harvest Medicine since about 2018. Um, and he has recently been uh, promoted to our v vice president. So we have some great speakers for you today. Faraz will be speaking on the uh, practical applications of medical can cannabis um, following Dr. DeSanctis. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over our presentation to Dr. DeSanctis and Faraz today. Thank you, Jeanette, uh, for that introduction and good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, thankful for your, having invited me to speak to you about medical cannabis and neuropathic pain. This is a subject I'm quite passionate about and in particularly excited about passing on some information and education. So before I, I get into the talk relative to the can cannabis, I would like to make sure we're all on the same page about some definitions and terms with regard to neuropathy. Um, we're gonna talk about what is it? We feel pain because we have a somatosensory system, somato meaning bodily and sensory sensation. What is that? What could go wrong? And what are the causes of neuropathic pain? So after we go over that, we'll dive into our human endocannabinoid system. This is a system that has only been discovered about 20 years ago. It has many physiological effects, but for the purpose of today's talk, we're going to just address how it um, impacts pain perception. We'll talk about human and plant cannabinoids, and we'll also talk about a clinical scenario that beautifully illustrates how um, cannabis can help, uh, or, or I should say the endocannabinoid system can alter how we feel pain um, with a patient who has neuropathic pain. And then we'll talk about some evidence-based recommendations. So the question today is, I have neuropathy, is cannabis right for me? And neuropathy is one of those invisible conditions where it is not apparent to many people that you are suffering from it. This might be a typical patient in a waiting room with neuropathy with no outward uh, evidence of medical distress. But the reality is most people with neuro neuropathic pain feel a little bit like this. So it's a condition that has a significant impact on our well being and needs addressing. Neuropathic pain, at least in the States, there's an estimated almost 10% of the population suffers from it, um, from signs of neuropathic um, and symptoms of neuropathic pain and an estimated two to 3% of the population in Canada. I did look at those numbers, there's a bit of a disparity and I wonder in the US there's a significant epidemic of obesity and there might be more diabetic neuro uh, neuropathy that's accounting for that. Patients with poorly controlled neuropathic pain have poor health status and increased symptoms of anxiety and depression. And so what is neuropathic pain? It is defined as pain caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory nervous system. I'm going to explain to you a little bit about what that is. This, this system, present in all mammals, consists of three main neurons, so primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary ones, as depicted in this image, are also referred to as nociceptive pain receptors. And these function to identify inflammation, pain, and trauma, and then send that information to the brain for processing. So in this picture, we have depicted skin, muscle, and joint. There are many other locations, obviously. But once these receptors identify this pain painful stimuli, it relays is up to the secondary neuron branch, which is basically the spinal cord and uh, the brain stem. And so, and from the brain stem moving forward, 
it, it goes to the thalamus, which is the area of the brain, which then directs that information to either the motor cortex or the somatosensory cortex. Now, in this image, we can see the primary uh, um, cortexes, both motor and sensory depicted. It's like a hairband across the brain, I guess, the thalamus at the base. So the motor cortex is, is involved in planning, control, and execution of voluntary movement, whereas the sensory cortex is involved in touch, proprioception, which refers to our awareness of our body in space, nociception, which is the awareness of a painful stimuli, and temperature. Here we have at the top of this slide, the brain, and with that band-like motor sensory areas of the brain depicted. Below this, we have what's called a homunculus. So the homunculus represents a map of the brain areas dedicated to motor and sensory processing. And so basically what you'll see here is some imagery of body parts. The distorted body parts actually represents the relative importance that uh, the brain devotes to certain body parts. And you'll notice, for example, the hands and the fingers are significantly larger than the torso and the trunk, uh, both on the motor side and the sensory side. And the reason for that is we have many more complex fine motor activities we carry out with our fingers, let's say relative to our knee. And uh, as far as sensation go, we have many more nerves in our hands. So how is pain felt? First of all, Pain is a, uh, an alarm system. It's, uh, it has a purpose to warn us of a potentially harmful situation. This would be known as nociceptive pain. So here we have uh, an individual, let's say this person puts their hands on a hot plate, a uh, nociceptive receptor in the hand identifies trauma, inflammation, pain, basically. That message is relayed up the peripheral nerve to the secondary spinal cord into the thalamus, and then it's relayed to the um, motor and to the sensory cortex. The motor cortex tells us quickly to remove our hand uh, voluntarily, and the sensory cortex tells us we have pain. So when pain persists after the end of the original stimulus, we refer to that as neuropathic pain. And when we develop a circuit, where that pain is continuously being um, circuited into an area of the brain, that refers to central hyperactivation. And where we can see this, for example, is fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia is a condition um, that has abnormal nociceptive receptor function and pain processing in the brain, which is altered. So someone in a flare, they, they refer to their uh, fibromyalgia flare, their skin may be very uh, sensitive you touch them just lightly, and yet it is perceived as a very painful stimuli. In addition, that stimulus, when it gets to the brain, may be uh, interpreted differently. So neuropathic pain is difficult to describe, and primarily because it generally falls outside of the pain experience of people who have normal somatosensory systems, right? So uh, we'll often find ourselves in a situation where you're trying to explain what you're feeling to someone who has no concept of what you're what you're, you know, you know what, it, what it's like. And I've had patients describe their pain in ways such as a, like I have a torch on my feet or I have a crevice in my chest or, and so forth. Just really odd ways um, interpreted by them, but it is something that is difficult to explain. There is a variety of classifications of pain. For today's purpose, we'll talk about nociceptive and neuropathic pain, obviously and that's depicted in that green area. Pain can be acute, so um, nociceptive pain is generally acute, such as an injury or postoperatively, or chronic. Now, a nociceptive chronic pain would be something like osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, where you have these pain receptors in inflamed joints, can constantly sending information to the brain about that pain. Or it could be of a neuropathic origin. So neuropathic could be central, as in central, we might refer to as a post-stroke situation, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, migraine, HIV, and such, versus a peripheral neuropathic pain, which is like a post-herpetic neuralgia or a diabetic neuropathy. There's also a trigeminal neuralgia, and all of these fall in under the umbrella of neuropathic pain. Some of the causes of neuropathic pain, uh, there can be physical compression of the spinal cord, let's say by a tumor, 
toxin exposure, such as we see in chemotherapy and alcohol uh, exposure and heavy metals, infectious diseases such as HIV and herpes zoster, which causes shingles. There are metabolic abnormalities such as diabetes and vitamin deficiencies and abnormal immune activation, such as we see in multiple sclerosis. There is an umbrella of conditions referred to as hereditary peripheral neuropathies, which we quite poorly understand. These conditions can manifest at any stage in life, and we really don't understand what the triggers are for them. So the mechanisms of neuropathic pain then, um, it is a maladaptive change occurring in response to injury and resulting in primary or secondary neuron pathways deviating from their normal function of alerting the brain to actual or potential tissue damage. Tertiary neurons, abnormal response to pain message also result in neuropathic pain. So this happens either by an abnormal increase in the message of pain to the brain and or an exaggerated response of the brain to that pain. So that gives us sort of a basic understanding of how we feel pain. Um, and we're gonna talk about the endocannabinoid system and um, how it intersects with pain perception. So this was a system discovered less than 20 years ago, surprisingly. Um, it uh, has many physiological effects. For the purpose of today's talk, I'm only gonna speak about uh, its part in pain perception and neuropathic pain in particular. It's made up of three components. We produce internally cannabinoid molecules. And these are, because they're internally produced, are referred to as endogenous. Neurohormones or neurotransmitters could be other terms that we use. The second component is that we have cannabinoid receptors within us. And these receptors are um, what these neurohormones, our internal endogenous cannabinoids, bind to to cause an effect. And finally, there's a whole host of enzymes responsible for the production, regulation, transport, and also the breakdown and metabolism of these internally produced endocannabinoids. So the types of cannabinoids, as I've alluded to, um, the first is the endocannabinoids, the one we, all mammals and humans produce. The two that have been most commonly studied are called anandamide or, and 2-arachidonoglycerol, which we will refer to as 2-AG. Now, anandamide is, you can think of as a first cousin to CBD, and 2-AG is kind of a first cousin uh, relationship to, T to THC. Phytocannabinoids, which are phyto meaning from the plant source, are cannabidiol, long form for CBD, and tetrahydrocannabinol, which uh, long form for THC. There are many other phytocannabinoids, but these are the two that have been studied the most and have found to intersect with our endocannabinoid system. Finally, there's a group of synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry has tried to emulate some of these molecules for the purpose of generating some um, patented uh, medications to treat various conditions. This is an important slide. Um, and so what we're looking at over here on the left are the phytocannabinoids at the top left, cannabidiol or CBD, and the bottom left, tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. The top right is anandamide, our own human um, CBD equivalent. And on the bottom right, 2-AG, it's our THC equivalent. Now they may not look anything alike, but when we examine these carefully, where these circles appear, uh, it shows that they all have a common molecular arm. And this common arm is why phytocannabinoids can intersect with our system because they bind to the same receptors as the internal cannabinoid molecules do. So some of the properties of CBD, first it's not impairing. It is an anticonvulsant, which means it can lower seizure threshold. It's an anti-inflammatory, which I'll explain a little bit more so afterwards. It's been shown to reduce muscle spasm. Uh, it's useful in chronic pain. We'll go over how that is the case and also in mood disorders. I wanna point out the mood disorder where we have the most robust evidence is anxiety. We have very little to no evidence that CBD can help depression unless CBD decreases pain and therefore you improve your depression. THC also has properties. 
it can produce euphoria. Now, euphoria is that term that we refer to, uh, which is the high associated with the use of THC. Uh, as a result, it can cause impairment. It does have a pain relieving property and it acts as a sedative as well. It's an antiemetic, which means it can help reduce nausea, useful in let's say post chemotherapy induced nausea. And it's an appetite stimulant, which is quite useful in uh, wasting syndrome with HIV patients actually and it can help regulate mood. I just wanna point out for the mood we're referring to, it is a mood elevator, it lifts the mood, but it's because of the side effects and other th properties associated with THC, it is really not an appropriate uh, long-term use as an antidepressant. So this slide um, shows the relative distribution of CB1 receptors to which THC binds and CB2 receptors in the human body to which CBD binds. So you'll notice CB1 receptors are mostly in the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system versus CB2, which is mostly in um, organs and the peripheral nervous system. Now, you'll notice there's a few uh, blue dots representing uh, CBD uh, receptors in the brain. I wanna point out that these are um, receptors found on cells called microglial cells that are involved in the immune health of the brain. So binding of CBD to that area of the brain does not cause impairment. So in this image, we have, um, again, a depiction of the relative distribution of these CB1 and CB2 receptors, but on the right, THC represented by a red key um, is seen as a key and a lock effect, uh, that key being THC binding to its receptor. And when it binds, uh, it has an outcome or an effect. Same goes for CBD. When it binds to the CB2 receptor, the key and a lock result in a series of biochemical events and a physiological effect. So the reason CBD is non-impairing is because it does not bind to CB1 receptors. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about a clinical scenario uh, that beautifully illustrates what happens to pain perception when you deviate from normal functioning ECS. This is an article that came out of National Geographic Future of Medicine Special Edition. Um, that was in January, 2020. And here we have the patient, her name is Cameron. She's a woman from Scotland. Uh, she, Cameron was going in to have a thumb joint replaced. Now, Excuse as you recall me. from the... Sorry, um, I've had a request that you're speaking a little bit fast for some of our seniors. If you could okay. try to slow down just a smidge. Thank you. Sure. sure. Um, so Cameron is a uh, patient from Scotland who is going in for a thumb replacement, a joint replacement. As you recall from the homunculus that I showed you a bit earlier, we have a disproportionate amount of brain um, meant to process sensation in hands and fingers. As a result, any surgery or intervention of hands and fingers is very, very painful. The surgeon advised Cameron as such and suggested that she would need significant amount of narcotic post-surgery. So the anesthetist and surgeon were both amazed um, after the surgery, uh, two hours after, Cameron had not even requested for a Tylenol. And so they realized this woman had a mutation that would have affected her ability to feel pain. And they sent her off to University College London uh, where she had her genetics assessed. And what they found is that she had a gene mutation that reduced the natural breakdown of her neurotransmitter anandamide. So anandamide um, therefore accumulated in Cameron and insulated her against feeling pain. So in this image, I'm just going to explain that step that was interfered with in patient Cameron. We have anandamide on top. Anandamide is produced on demand when there is a trigger of pain. And upon that trigger, it's released, it binds to nociceptive receptors, it binds to different areas to mitigate and reduce that pain, allowing us to address it and uh, find a solution to reduce that pain. 
After it does, uh, it's what it that needs to do, it's taken up by uh, cell, cells. And in that cell, there is an enzyme called fatty acid amide hydrolase. This enzyme breaks anandamide down into a product called the arachidonic acid and ethanolamine. So Cameron had a gene deletion where she had very, very low levels of FAAH inhibitor. And as a result, the anandamide she produced accumulated and was there to suppress pain perception. Now, the, what I want you to focus on is this arachidonic acid metabolite or breakdown product because it sits at the top of a ladder of biochemical events that then result in inflammation at the site of injury. This is a busy slide, but what I want you to focus on is in the center we have that metabolite arachidonic acid. Normally, there's a series of events that result, therefore, in inflammation occurring in all these various body uh, parts on the bottom here, kidney, brain, uh, muscle, etc. And so uh, anti-inflammatories and aspirin will interfere with that ladder high up in the chain of events, whereas what we're going to find out is CBD actually interferes with that chain of events very low down. As a result, CBD is not metabolized in the kidney, nor does it upset the gut, which is the case for anti-inflammatories. Again, a very busy slide, but I want you to focus primarily on the red circle over here. There are several methods, biochemical methods, by which anandamide helps interfere with that inflammatory cascade. And so one of them uh, is that it, when it, you'll notice at the top, the molecule of an antibody binding to that orange uh, configuration, CB2 receptor. And by doing so, it actually inhibits an enzyme called adenylocyclase, which causes a disruption in that cascade and a decrease in that inflammatory response. There are actually several other um, sort of biochemical effects these are presented on uh, items one and two on the left, but the slides are even more complicated than this. And I thought just it's um, worthy to know that there are different ways in which uh, an endomite helps reduce inflammation. The other way that CBD and an endomite work within our system, and which I'd like to bring up, um, it has to do with neur uh, neuropathy or neuronal damage in the brain. So I'm going to give you an example of a cerebral vascular accident, which is a stroke. So a stroke results from an, an artery getting blocked. And as a result, a small um, area of the brain then no longer gets uh, oxygen. It's called an ischemic injury. And because of that, neurons die. And when they die, they release uh, a um, neurotransmitter called glutamate, as you see in the slide over here. Glutamate is very, it's a hyper excitatory uh, cytotoxic neurotransmitter that can cause death to adjacent neurons. And so a small area of injury can domino effects spread into other areas because of glutamate. Now, the postsynaptic membrane you see on the bottom right has a negative feedback loop that it can initiate by releasing anandamide into the cleft, as you see by those little orange uh, triangles. And these then move forward to the uh, presynaptic membrane neuron binding there and reducing that glutamate release. So it's a way to protect the, the neur neurons around an injured neuron. So to recap, everyone has an endocannabinoid system. We manufacture endocannabinoids. Phytocannabinoids are produced by the cannabis plant. Both human and plant cannabinoids interact with our ECS system. And the main types of receptors they interact with are CB1 and CB2 receptors. THC interacts with CB1 receptors. This can cause impairment. CBD interacts with CB2 receptors. These are non-impairing. Now, this isn't exactly a recap, but I'll explain it to you. Um, there is robust evidence uh, with studies done that CBD has a synergistic effect with opioids. So what that means is that if you're taking a narcotic, I use opioids and narcotics interchangeably, by the way. Um, when you are taking a narcotic in the presence of CBD, 
that narcotic will bind more vigorously for a longer time to the opioid receptor, resulting in better uh, pain control for a longer time. And as a result, individuals who are taking narcotics while on CBD are able to lower their narcotic dosing. So what are the current recommendations for cannabis use today? The Canadian Pain Society has recommended using cannabis um, for neuropathic pain third line. They state you're better off trying an antidepressant first. Um, methadone, which is a, an opiate agonist um, and, or, and or topical anesthetic agents. The American Academy of Neurology um, put out a statement saying that oral cannabis extract and vaporized cannabis were effective for both subjective and objective measures of spasticity in multiple sclerosis. The European Federation of Neurological Society endorsed using cannabinoids for second line use in the treatment of central neuropathic pain and Health Canada guidelines also suggested an algorithm as to how, how and when to use cannabis. Um, all of these um, statements are available at the end of the talk from, for their source. Now, this is a busy slide. This is the algorithm presented by Health Canada to us. Really, what you need to look at is on the right, there are three circles that say yes, yes, and yes. And so if you have a patient with neuropathic pain, you start by giving them a standard pharmacological agent. If they respond, fine, you remain on it. If they don't, you try a second pharmacological agent. If they don't respond to either or they have significant side effects, that's the point at which they suggest trialing and considering uh, cannabinoids. There's a global task force that was put together involving 20 countries. It's a worldwide input of specialists. The publication for this is pending. I had um, the opportunity to sit in on a talk in September of last year by one of the physicians who were involved in this. Um, the conclusions were that medical cannabis could be useful for mixed pain, neuropathic pain, inflammatory pain, and what we refer to as no suplastic pain, such as in fibromyalgia. They developed dosing protocols, uh, one conservative for elderly and or individuals with a lot of comorbidities and another protocol for a more rapid arm for severe pain, palliative pain, and cancer pain. So I haven't, I didn't, the, all of these are available at the uh, link that's indicated below. It's quite of an extensive protocol, but they are available for viewing. So what are the potential clinical Im implications now that we're aware of the endocannabinoid neuro, neuro, neuronal hormonal system? It's a mouthful. We are aware that there are medical conditions related to various neurohormone deficiencies. There are other neurotransmitter systems that have pathological conditions attributable to their deficiency. So Alzheimer's, for example, there's a loss of acetylcholine. Parkinson's, there's a de deficiency of dopamine. Depression, there's low levels of serotonin and other neurohormones. One cannot wonder then at this point that now that we're aware of the endocannabinoid system, is there an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome? We're aware that they're poorly understood and difficult to treat pain syndromes such as fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, and migraines. And so it's possible that alterations in the ECS system could account for these conditions. We certainly need a lot more research to make that determination. The takeaways today from me are that currently treatments do not help all patients equally with neuropathic pain just because there are different kinds of neuropathic pains and different genetic sensitivities to cannabis. Cannabis can produce moderate pain relief in patients with neuropathic pain. This pain relieving effect may be more pronounced with individuals who have central as opposed to peripheral neuropathic pain. And cannabis also has a synergistic pain relieving effect with narcotics, allowing for reduction of narcotics. This is particularly important in our present day and age with our um, epidemic of opiate deaths. The takeaways for CBD are, one, we're aware that it's, in, it's actually ratified and indicated for neuropathic pain. It has an anti-inflammatory mode of action. It does act at nociceptive pain receptors uh, to reduce pain perception from the periphery and it acts synergistically with opioids. So at this point, I'd like to pass the talk on to Faraz Sashadina, 
and uh, then we'll take questions afterwards. Um, thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, as usual, I forgot to mention, if you do have questions, enter them into the chat box. There's some people who have been at asking questions through the chat box already. Um, and then we'll revisit those at the end of the talk. For sure. And uh, keep in mind that if there are any questions beyond what we've talked about today, there is going to be, I believe, a second presentation in regards to further accessing and further, um, further applications to how you guys can utilize the different products and the different products that are available and how to access them appropriately. So just keep that in mind. That's right. And that's going to be in the fall. Perfect. So uh, Dr. DeSanctis, I appreciate, uh, appreciate your support on this. And um, now that you guys are all experts on medical cannabis, I really don't have anything to add to you guys. You guys are all ready to go, right? Um, first off, we have to look at how we want to apply this in a practical sense. And no, unfortunately, I don't have any samples for anyone to, pro to be provided to anyone today. But uh, again, it's something that I've, I've sent up the chain of command and we'll try and see what we can do for next time. So going through what we're looking at as far as the practical application, we're going to be looking further at the plant and what, it, what it's comprised of, what is medical cannabis, how to utilize it, how to utilize it safely. And you're going to hear a few, few points from me, but the focus is always going to be on that tailored therapeutic approach for your guys' self and how to utilize the products safely and to the most benefit for um, various conditions here. So when we talk about medical cannabis, we, we all ask, even when I started going through medical school, medical cannabis wasn't something that was readily available to a lot of physicians, let alone the general public. So when we look at medical cannabis, you have to know that there's a variety of components that make up what medical cannabis is. So we'll look at starting at cultivars or what the strains are, then looking at cannabinoids themselves, and then finally the terpenes, which we look at as the cherry on top, but we'll focus on those first two today as a priority of what's gonna be uh, most beneficial for um, your conditions. So looking at the cultivars themselves, we, we always look at the medical market right now, and there's hundreds, if not more, different cultivars on the market. What does it mean? Does it mean that I'm just supposed to grab some dry herb and start utilizing? No, there's a lot of, a potential for use. And it's important to look at what your underlying conditions are and what you're trying to use it for. So when we're looking at cultivars, we generally look at it in the sense of an indica and sativa as the predominant, as the main two um, components. Indica being the more relaxing, more sedating, more um, helpful in the sense that it calms you down and it allows you to function, uh, allows you to get that relaxation in. Sativa on the other hand, is more of that energizing component. It, it, it increases your alertness. It, it, it stimulates you and it gives you that more uplifting effect. However, right now, because of so much genetic hybridization that's occurred within the market and within um, the medical cannabis field right now, it's very difficult to find a pure indica or pure sativa strain. So we often refer to it as a sativa dominant or indica dominant, but it's very common that you're gonna see a hybrid of both. But again, being indica dominant and sativa dominant, based on what your needs are, it's gonna be important that if you're trying to take something throughout the day, you're not gonna take something like an indica that's gonna put you to sleep and prevent you be from being able to function throughout the day. In, in, in the opposite sense, when you're trying to sleep, you're not gonna take something like a sativa that's gonna keep you awake and give, give you that energy. So it's important to look at what, the, what your conditions are, what you're trying to use it for, and what benefit you're trying to elicit. Keep in mind, we all have, because this is a plant-based product, we all are gonna have a variable response to this. And this is where it's important to follow up with your healthcare practitioners to ensure that we're doing it properly. So within that, we were looking at the next, next category, which is cannabinoids. So you heard about CBD, right? We, we've looked at what the benefits of CBD are. It's your non-impairing. It's, it's going to help with your chronic relief. It's going to help with your inflammation. It's going to help with anxiety. THC, on the other hand, can be an impairing, but it is very good for acute response pain. It's very good for um, rapid pain relief. But does it mean that we have to stick to one or the other? 
No, it's going to be what benefits yourself. And we often in, a, in our approach with patients, look at a balanced approach, looking at utilizing CBD throughout the day, utilizing something that's going to provide you more with that chronic relief while you're still able to get more rapid relief through t- the use of THC, depending on how you're using it. Now, now that you know all that, do we just grab some dry herb and smoke it? No, dry herb is available and it is one of the options that patients can use. And in the past, patients prior to the medical cannabis market from opening up were self-medicating through the use of going to their, going through black market means. What we were finding is that they were using it for a therapeutic approach, but there's better ways to utilize it. So smoking it is not one that we recommend for our patients. If you do desire to use uh, uh, the dry herb, we oftentimes recommend to our patients to use a vaporizer, which you see here. What that'll allow you to do is get more of the benefit of the whole plant, but you're able to control temperatures. And by utilizing different temperatures, you're actually going to be baking that dry herb to elicit the essential oils, elicit the cannabinoids to get more of a, a full relief and a full spectrum approach to your therapeutic response. Now, does that mean that every patient coming in is going to get a dry herb and be told you need to vaporize? Not at all. Most of our patients often look at the ingestive method. Most of our patients start with an oil or a soft gel or a spray looking at a format that is easily dosable and not, we don't want to introduce everyone to the idea of vaporizing. It isn't an option for everyone, but we're able to look at more of a chronic relief and long-term relief with the use of an ingestible format. And we'll go through that. With legalization, it's been nice because it, it brought new formats of products to the market. You were able to start accessing the oils and cannabinoids rather than in just the oil and dry herb format, in the format of chocolates, in the format of gummies. You're actually able to use it in a vape format or a topical format. And that's something that's coming more prolific to market right now. But again, there's a, there is education that's involved with each of these formats. And it really depends on what your use is and what you're trying to control. That being said, the primary mechanisms of both of them, are all these products come down to an inhaled versus an ingested format, other than the topicals, that is. So with the inhaled format, you're going to be looking at something that you're either going to be vaporizing or vaping, and you're looking at a rapid onset. The onset of action is going to be within seconds to minutes, with a max set of onset of around 30 minutes. What you do have to realize is that this can be a nice nice benefit for those that are looking for rapid relief, those are, that are looking for a rapid benefit in an acute flare, or in those that are trying to rapidly get to sleep. Is this for everyone? No, as I mentioned, the majority of our patients are actually focusing on the ingested format. The difference with the ingested format is, is it does take some time for onset. It takes, we normally recommend patients take it 90 minutes to two hours before, um, before they're going to bed or while they're doing it, while they're utilizing it throughout the day, because it does take time for it to go through your system, get metabolized and become activated in the body. As a result, however, you're going to see that the duration of action for the ingested methods is going to be longer. You're going to be looking at a time of duration of six to eight hours, or it could be as long as 12 hours, depending on the patient's uh, body composition and their liver metabolism. So to to maybe streamline it here, we'll look at the fact that within the inhaled format, you're looking at a rapid onset, rapid relief, but short uh, duration of action. So it's going to be Rapid, quick in, but anytime we say quick in, we always look at quick out. Rapid relief, but not a long-term relief. For those that are using the oils or in the ingested format, they're going to be looking at more of a sustained relief and more of a long-term duration of action. And this has been really beneficial, and this uh, this plays in part to what and how you're dosing your medical cannabis. That being said, there are going to be benefits to both sides, as I mentioned, and I'll, I, again, we like to talk about is that acute relief. So if you're looking for, if you have that acute pain flare, the inhaled format can be really beneficial to manage that acute pain flare. With neuropathic pain, patients often find that the inhaled format can be beneficial for that acute pain setting. Again, it is going to be short-term relief, not long-term relief. The ingested formats are going to be more of a sustained relief. So patients often dose with the ingested format throughout the day 
because it, it provides them with six to eight hours of relief. And then maybe take a little bit of the inhaled format to top up and provide a little bit more extended relief on top of what they're currently getting. Whether or not it's in the food form, in uh, it, as in the, with chocolates, cookies, or gummies, or the oils, either or is going to be metabolized and utilized in the same way. It really comes down to what your preference is. And if you want your medicine to be less like medicine, at the end of the day, there are some patients that just want their dose, they want the relief, doesn't matter how they take it. And we there's going to be ways that we can approach that for e individuals. That being said, a lot of research is being done on patients with neuropathic pain and which is the best format. And they found that the inhaled format versus the oral format both play a role in how that patient's relief will be. As I mentioned, often working synergistically to provide sustained relief and providing extended relief for the patient while using the inhaled format for more rapid uh, onset and more rapid relief. When we talk about medical cannabis, we always want to focus on safety. And safety is going to be our number one priority. And I think the best benefit of the medical cannabis system is how we're going to safely approach this. With CBD, the WHO has come out and issued a statement that it doesn't seem, it doesn't appear that it has the same abuse potential or harm potential as, let's say, an opioid. You're looking at uh, the risk benefit profiles of each of these products and what you're trying to get out of it. And a lot of patients have found, and even the WHO and research has indicated that CBD does not have the negative impact on the body or the side effects and addiction potential that's there with opioids. However, we do, however, want to focus on THC and the cautions that we always provide our patients. So we often recommend to our patients not utilizing products before they go to work, not utilizing products before driving. We, we, give, we, uh, we tell our patients greater than four hours if you're looking at the inhaled product, or if you're looking at the ingested product, you're looking at greater than eight to 12 hours prior to driving because we wanna make sure that we're not risking any impairment. We wanna make sure that people are being safe. And with the use of these THC products, there is the risk for impairment to be longer lasting depending on the patient. And again, that's why we recommend for the daily use of CBD and more focus on THC at nighttime relief. Along with that, we often see that patients are self-medicating, but using a combination of THC along with alcohol. And this is something that we, we try to avoid because again, they can the effects that they have on the body and the effects that they can have on impairment can be exponentially greater. So we wanna make sure that we're being safe by that and not combining that in a way that's gonna be dangerous to our patients. So we often tell our patients to avoid the use of alcohol alongside of um, THC. Now you'll notice that a lot of the side effects that patients uh, that you see here are also what, what improvements we're trying to get for patients. So anxiety is going to be a side effect of THC, but CBD can work well to manage that symptom. Depending on the use of THC or CBD, it can be an appetite stimulant or an appetite suppressant. It is real, fairly variable to the patient. Where we do find that we need to be cautious with CBD is when we look at changes in blood pressure. Patients often talk about the fact that they're feeling euphoric or they're feeling dizzy when they're using CBD. It's less about the euphoria and more about the fact that it causes a drop in your blood pressure. So patients find that they're getting that dizzy feeling, but it, it's often due to the drop in blood pressure and we need to make sure that we're monitoring that. Alongside of that, THC does have a stimulant effect on the heart, which can increase your blood pressure. So we always look at condition bases that uh, go hand in hand to ensure that we're curtailing any of the risk potential that's there. Alongside with that, as Dr. DeSanctis mentioned, you, you, you can see that euphoric effect. You can have effects causing fatigue or sleep, but that again can be the benefit of what THC is and what the indication of THC is, as well as sedation. And depending on what product and what you're using, the potential of nausea is there, but again, a potential relief source as well. That being said, we do wanna make sure that we're, we're looking at our patient's past medical history very, very thoroughly. So you'll notice that there's a few conditions there that aren't starred. These are conditions that we wanna make sure that we don't prescribe or authorize medical cannabis in. So patients with the history of psychosis, we don't wanna elicit that a psychotic event for those patients. And there, there is research that 
shows that there could be a correlation between the two. So we wanna make sure that we're minimizing that risk potential so we don't authorize for patients with psychosis. If you're allergic to cannabis, don't use cannabis. It's one of those things that seems like it's pretty straightforward, but oftentimes patients re start to realize these symptoms, not, not knowing that they're addressed or they're being elicited by cannabis. So as, as simple as it seems, if you're allergic to cannabis, it is something that we're gonna not authorize for. And finally, when you're breast, uh, breastfeeding or pregnant, we wanna, we wanna maintain both the safety of the mom as well as the baby in that case. And because there's not enough evidence, there's not enough research out there. And in fact, there's research saying the opposite that there could be, a, uh, there could be damage given to the, um, the baby in this case. We, want, we don't authorize to anyone that is breastfeeding or pregnant to ensure safety of both parties. That being said, you see the four conditions there that are stark. So when we're looking at bipolar disorder, heart disease, CVAs or strokes, or kidney issues, we, we do take the history, we do take the management of the patient, we look at the symptoms that they're um, going through, as well as work with their specialists to really thoroughly evaluate these patients. That being said, not every single one of these patients is automatically gonna be ruled out. There are times where we are able to authorize for patients that do have these conditions, but it does, it does mean that we need to ensure that we are talking to their specialists. We are talking, we are looking at their um, symptom management and their condition management to make sure we're being safe. So as a quick For recap us, here. Yep. Oh, could you explain CVA as well on your last slide there, what it means? Yeah, so CVA is going to be stroke. So any, it's, it's, a, it's a cerebrovascular accident. So this is going to be anything that affects your, uh, any uh, brain flow issues. It could be ischemic, hemorrhagic, or traumatic. But either, any of those three aspects, we want to make sure that we're not, um, we're being, we're not, we're not authorizing for medical cannabis, specifically THC, number one, because it can actually cause um, the arteries of the heart to constrict and elicit a further stroke, as well as we also look at CBD because normally after a CVA or a stroke, you're on anticoagulants or blood thinners. And with CBD, it can interact with warfarin and change your levels of warfarin. So we wanna make sure that we're being safe and looking at the risk potential that's there. Does that help answer that question? I think so, thanks. Perfect. So just a quick recap, again, cannabis, you're gonna have a few components, cultivars, which is gonna be your sativa or indica, quick way to remember it, and I learned this from the team at the clinic, sativas are gonna be your stimulators, so S and S, and indicas put you in the couch. Simple way to remember it, but it'll, it's a good memory tool to be able to refer back to. From there, we look at cannabinoids, CBD, THC mainly, but there's over 107 different cannabinoids that they're working with. Within the medical market, we're looking, focusing on CBD and THC currently. And then as far as the formatting goes, it's gonna come in a variety of formats, inhaled, ingested, and topical, but the inhaled format is gonna be one that's gonna be rapid onset and short duration, whereas the ingested is gonna be your delayed onset and longer duration. That being said, with everything available in the rec market or in the black market, why even bother with the medical market? What's the benefit of it? And I hope that we've been able to allude to some of those points there, but at the end of the day, when you're working with medical cannabis, you're looking at working with the licensed producers, you're looking at uh, working with Health Canada regulations, which forces licensed producers to routinely lab test their products and ensure safety and consistency. Alongside that, with the medical market, you're also working alongside your healthcare practitioners who, current, who make sure that they're doing a thorough history assessment, looking at drug to drug interactions and making sure that this therapy is tailored for you. My favorite story is actually a patient that uh, one of the first patients that I saw at Harvest, which was a 92 year old at the time who came in with her walker um, she had very chronic pain and uh, of her hip and knee, as well as a neuropathic pain from a back issue that she had suffered. She had come in because she, her son had actually provided her with a uh, joint and she found rapid relief. She found rapid management, but she came in to the clinic very stressed out. And upon finding out what she was stressed out about, she was worried that if she was gonna use medical cannabis, 
she was going to gain a ton of weight because she ended up finishing two bags of Cheetos that night. Again, it is going to be about how you utilize these products, how you get the benefit out of these products. And that's the benefit of the medical market and the, uh, working with the medical clinics is it provides you that uh, tailored approach. We are currently doing a lot of research where we've got a lot of protocol in place to build our own research, as well as work with uh, institutions across Canada and throughout the world to be able to provide up-to-date um, up research to our patients, as well as educational materials. When you go to a lot of the stores, your the uh, employees there aren't, aren't allowed to be providing you what can help you with sleep, what can help you with anxiety, what can help you with pain. They're there just to be selling you the product. This is where the medical clinics can provide you a, an, a more tailored and safe approach and ongoing support. If you have any questions, I can promise you, I'll get Jeanette to be there throughout the night and she'll be available. She loves calls at three, four in the morning. So I can even give you her personal number and she'll be able to help you out with that, no problem. But we do have our clinics nationally. So we have our support center that's available at all times. Within the medical market, you're looking at diverse products, your diverse selections and consistency. There's gonna be compassionate programs that are available to patients that are, are having difficulty accessing everything that they need to, as well as insurance coverage and tax reimbursements that are there. What we'll do is we'll probably go through this a little bit more during our second presentation, but if you do have any questions or concerns about that, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be able to uh, help um, provide you with some resources in regards to that. So all this is great, but how do you access it? How, how do you get medical cannabis? So with us, again, the first step is considering whether or not medical cannabis is gonna be right for you. So we do have our self-assessment online. You can go do that or even just call into the clinic. We, we do accept referrals, but we do accept non-referral patients too we, because we do our own assessment on these patients. You book your appointment, you'll meet with our healthcare team. So you'll meet with the healthcare practitioners, you'll meet with our staff, and they'll be able to get you um, that thorough assessment done and dem demonstrate what is going to be the best products and best dosing for you. After that, we do have a whole side of the clinic dedicated just to patient ed education, which will walk through all the licensed producers in Canada right now. There's over 150 licensed producers, 1,500 different products on the market right now. And our goal is to get the guesswork out of that. We don't wanna be taking guesswork with your health. Your health is our number one priority and your safety is our first priority. And we wanna make sure that we're removing that guesswork. From there, we'll get you registered and you'll order your product directly from your licensed producer. We don't supply the product, it'll get mailed directly to your house. So you'll be able to just enjoy the benefits of your medical cannabis. Up to this point, we have had uh, over 150,000 patient visits. So we have seen quite a few patients to be able to provide this education, provide this, um, provide these educational materials and provide that tailor, tailored therapy. Every patient is going to be different. So you won't be, it's not like just grabbing Tylenol off the shelf and hoping for the best. No, there's going to be a matter of education and specific dosing that's going to be there for you. And conditions that we often look at. The may, uh, we were currently looking at a variety of these conditions, anxiety, a lot of chronic pain, whether or not it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory, neuropathic pain being one of them. Um, we're looking at migraines, GI disorders, MS, and one of the biggest ones and the ones that we're most passionate about is opioid reduction. Finding patients being able to wean off of some of these medications, like uh, for example, narcotics, otherwise we can look at the use of Neurontin, Gabapentin, and Lyrica being able to reduce the need for some of these medications and wean off of that. That being said, we'll work alongside with your healthcare practitioners, that being your family doctor or your specialist, to ensure that we're doing it in a safe manner and they're on board with what we're doing. We would like to make sure that we're working with the whole team uh, fully. Again, as I mentioned, we're here at any time. If you do have any questions, uh, we have... We have our emails there, we have our social medias, and we have uh, Jeanette and Barb here that are part of our great team that are there for our patient experience and making sure that all resources and education is being provided to our patients. And if there are any questions or any thoughts, please feel free to email us, call us. Jeanette has our contact information if you do need to be transferred over. Otherwise, we're here to help and we wanna make sure that we're doing right by you. So I, I do appreciate that's everything that I've got for today. 
if anyone wants to write down any of our references, I welcome you to quickly jot all these uh, email uh, links down. Um, and we'll make sure that those are available to anyone that do require.